Hi there, Glenn Lowry back again with an audio note for the newsletter at Substack and all of those out there who follow The Glenn Show. I was speaking of race and identity and authenticity and telling the story of my betrayal of my friend Witty in part one. And so we will now begin part two. That was not exactly a profile in carriage on my part, I must confess. My friendship with Woody limped along for years, and then I moved away from Chicago, and we lost touch. We never really discussed the incident when I betrayed him. Much later, I learned that he had been sympathetic to my plight because he understood that if I were forced to choose, as he would put it, between my friend and my people, I'd have to choose my people. He only wished that I had made him aware of how anguished I was about the whole thing, which I never did. And now he's gone, passed away a few years ago. This event of a half century ago is etched indelibly in my mind, serving as a kind of private metaphor underscoring just how difficult it can be for us to live in good faith and also how vitally important it is that we try. In the memoir that I am working on now, the question of how does one live in good faith is at the center of my thinking. And that has drawn me back to this incident with Woody a half century ago. That test of integrity in a South Side Chicago church basement and my failure in the face of it have helped me become aware of the depth of my need for the approval of others, particularly co-racialist. I willingly betrayed a person whom I loved and who loved me in order to lessen the risk that I might be rejected by strangers who happened to be in my racial tribe. In a way, at that moment and often later in my life, I was passing too. That is, hoping to be mistaken for something I was not. I had feared that to proclaim before the black radicals in that audience that this supposed white boy at my side was, in fact, our brother would have compromised my own chance of being received among them as a genuine colleague. The indignant brother who challenged Woody's right to speak was not merely imposing a racial test. Only blacks are welcome here. He was mainly applying a loyalty test. You are either with us or against us. And that was a test which anyone present could fail through a lack of conformity with the collectively enforced political norm. I now know that denying one's genuine convictions for the sake of social acceptance is a price society often demands of the individual. And all too often, we willingly pay that price. I recall this story about Witty because his dilemma and mine conveys an important truth about race and identity in American society, a truth that has wide application beyond the bounds of my personal experience. What made Witty's situation so difficult is that given the expectations and stereotypes held by others, there seemed to be no way for him to avoid living fraudulently, either as a black person who was passing for white or as a white person who was trying too hard to be black. Actually, it now seems clear to me that he was neither. Witty, like me and like all of us, was a human being trying to make his way in the world, struggling to find himself and seeking recognition on his own terms. As his close friend and frequent companion, I had become familiar with and occasionally shared in the pitfalls of his situation. When seeing us together, people would assume both that he was white and that I was the kind of Negro who hangs out with white boys. I resented that assumption. Since then, as an American intellectual of African descent, making my living as a teacher and writer during a period of great transformation in our society, I have often experienced this dissonance 
between my self-concept and the socially imputed definition of who I am supposed to be. Many of us, I dare say most, in one way or another have to confront a similar dilemma. I have had to face the problem of balancing my desire not to disappoint the expectations of others with a conviction that one must live, or at least strive to live, authentically. This, by the way, does not make me a heroic figure. I eschew the libertarian ideologue's rhetoric about some glorious, autonomous individual who, though put upon by society, blazes his path all alone. I acknowledge that the opposition I'm presenting here between the individual and society is inherently ambiguous, that the self is inevitably shaped by the objective world and by other selves. I know that what one is being faithful to when resisting the temptation to conform to others' expectations by living authentically is necessarily a socially determined, even if subjectively experienced, version of the self. And I wish to reiterate here that while I'm speaking from personal experience, the phenomenon at issue wherein identity becomes the enemy of authenticity affects all of us and is by no means restricted to the issue of race. In his masterwork on liberty, John Stuart Mill offers a radical, passionate defense of the norm of unencumbered public discussion. All Americans should acquaint themselves with Mill's profound argument, which holds that individual persons must be allowed to express themselves freely, except when harm results for discrete individuals. Mill's point is cultural as well as political. He's concerned not only with law, but also with culture. Writes Mill in that great work, Society can and does execute its own mandates, and if it issues wrong mandates instead of right or any mandates at all in things with which it ought not to meddle, it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression, since though not usually upheld by such extreme penalties, it leaves fewer means of escape, penetrating much more deeply into the details of life and enslaving the soul itself. Protection, therefore, against the tyranny of the magistrate is not enough. There needs protection also against the tyranny of the prevailing opinion and feeling, against the tendency of society to impose by other means than civil penalties its own ideas and practices as rules of conduct on those who dissent from them. End of quote from John Stuart Mill. Growing into intellectual maturity has been, for me, largely a process of becoming free of the need to have my choices validated by the brothers. After many years, I have come to understand that until I became willing to risk the derision of the crowd, I had no chance to discover the most important truths about myself or about life, to know my calling, to perceive my deepest value commitments to recognize the goals most worth striving toward. The most important challenges and opportunities that confront any of us derive not from our cultural or sexual identities, not from our ethnic or racial conditions, but from our common human condition. I am a husband, a father, a son, a teacher, an intellectual, a citizen. In none of these roles is my race irrelevant, but neither can identity alone provide much guidance for my quest to adequately discharge these responsibilities. The particular features of one's social condition, the external givens, these things merely set the stage of one's life. They do not provide a script. That script must be internally generated. It must be a product of a reflective deliberation about the meaning of this existence for which no political program or ethnic category could ever substitute. Or, to shift the metaphor slightly, 
the socially contingent features of one's situation, one's racial heritage, family background, sexual orientation, and so on, and the prevailing views and attitudes about these things, these identity tropes that are held by others in society, such things are the building blocks, the raw material out of which one must yet construct the edifice of a life. The authentic expression of a person's individuality is to be found in the blueprint that he or she employs to guide this project of self-authorship. And the problem of devising such a plan for one's life confronts all people, whatever their race, class, ethnicity, or other identifying category. It is by facing and solving this problem that we grow as human beings and give meaning and substance to our lives. A personal program overly dependent on the contingencies of identity falls tragically short of its potential because it embraces too parochial a conception of what is humanly possible and of what is humanly desirable. This is especially important, I think, as a consideration for those of us who belong to historically oppressed and stigmatized groups. Ironically, to the extent that we Black people see ourselves primarily through a racial lens, we may end up sacrificing possibilities for the kind of personal development that would ultimately further our collective racial interest. For we cannot be truly free men and women while laboring under a definition of self that is derived from the perceptual view of our oppressor and that is confined to the contingent facts of our oppression. In A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, James Joyce has this to say about Irish nationalism, quoting Joyce. When the soul of a man is born in this country, there are nets flung at it to hold it back from flight. You talk to me of nationality, language, religion. I shall try to fly by these nets. Do you know what Ireland is? Ireland is the old sow that eats her feral. Close quote. Wearing one's racial identity too heavily can work similarly to hold back young black souls from their flight into the open skies of American society. Of course, there is the constraint of racism also holding us back, but the trick, as James Joyce knew, is to turn such nets into wings. One cannot do that if one refuses to see that ultimately it is neither external constraint nor external opportunity, but rather an indwelling spirit that makes such flight possible. End of note.